And thank you for being with us today, everybody, especially on short notice. Um, we are going to talk about annual program evaluation for the dual language programs today. And um, I'm honored to be here with uh, some of your colleagues and our, our leaders in dual language. And I'm going to just um, hold a minute and we'll start um, with their introductions. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Andler. I'm the Director of State and Federal Programs. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I love early learning, dual language, and all of the programs I get to oversee. You might hear an early learner outside my office. I'm not sure if that my microphone's picking that up, um, but it's a pleasure to be with you all. I'm from the SELA School District, which is near Yakima. Hi, hey, everybody. I'm Liz Hawkins, and I am principal at Moxie Elementary. I'm with the East Valley School District in the Yakima Valley, and we have the dual language program here at our elementary school. Happy to be here. Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Van Stratton, and I'm the assistant principal at Madison Elementary, which is a K-5 dual language elementary school in the Mount Vernon School District in the Skagit Valley area, and it's a pleasure to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Katherine Carrison. I'm the director of the English Language Learner Department in Evergreen Public Schools down in Vancouver, Washington with Jake and Camille. And um, very excited to be here. We've, we've put a lot of heart and uh, sweat and tears into this work and we're excited to be sharing it with you. Thank you, everybody. And I'm Patty Finnegan with OSPI, and I'm coming to you today from Olympia, which is uh, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Squaxin Island Nation. And on this slide here, we have OSPI's vision, mission, and values. Um, and I'll be running through my portion of this presentation rather quickly. You'll have the slide deck so you can dig into things a little further. But I just want to point out the first sentence in the mission, transform K-12 education to a system that is centered on closing opportunity gaps and is characterized by high expectations for all students and educators. And that really um, describes what dual language education is in Washington. And uh, we're very blessed in Washington. We have a state superintendent who has a vision uh, for dual language for all students, um, that all students would have access to dual language education by 2030. And also our um, work in dual language and statute in dual language in Washington prioritizes multilingual English learners and Native American students for the purpose of uh, closing opportunity gaps for these student populations. So rather unique in terms of uh, dual language programs across the state, or excuse me, across the nation. The framework that we're um, scaffolding Superintendent Rick Dahl's vision for is uh, Again, is based off of the guiding principles for dual language education, the third edition, which is this book here in the corner. And um, I think everybody in our grant program is probably aware of this or has several hard copies, but if you don't, they're fairly inexpensive, highly recommend um, actually getting the hard copies. You can download this, the link is here. Um, but it's one of these where you want to just dig into it with your teams, highlight, put lots of sticky notes on because you'll be going back to it a lot. And um, our dual language task forces, when they met and decided on a framework, they went towards this book because it is about closing opportunity gaps for multilingual learners. And Cal, one of the uh, authors of the book, they recently put out an overview video and presentation. Um, those are linked at the bottom of the slide there. So part of this statewide scaffold of support that we're rolling out is grant support. And our legislators have been very generous. We've been able to put out almost three and a half million dollars in grants uh, just over three years here. Uh, we have 35 school districts and five state tribal compact schools in the grant program. And then also the professional learning communities. So uh, we have 
um, lots of leaders in the state that are sharing their time at each of the PLCs and um, basically to support one another. And we don't want people reinventing the wheel, right? So if um, Heidi Lamar and uh, Jennifer Johnson have some solutions for um, making core instruction robust enough where you can really minimize interventions, they're sharing. And they did actually do that sharing um, at the December PLC. Um, we um, have a collection of these presentations and I will be getting those out to folks via email, but also uh, through our open educational resources hub. So if you haven't had a chance to join us on these PLCs, uh, the links are here on this slide. Uh, if you want clock hours, you'll need to enroll through uh, PD Enroller. We use the same Zoom link for each PLC, um, but each of these PLCs does have a unique Zoom link. And dual language annual program evaluation. So we're just, um, not that folks haven't already been doing this for years, but we're uh, trying to systematize it across the state so we can build uh, sustainable, effective dual language programs whether you're in Southwest Washington or North, Northeast, any place that there would be consistency um, and that these programs are really designed to close opportunity gaps for multilingual learners and Native American students. Uh, and also you're gonna, people are already doing these because you're um, involved in continuous cycles of improvement. And um, by using the guiding principles, so the rubrics within this book, that then helps um, be very specific about how you want to modify your dual language program, but then also um, uh, systematize it in your uh, district's K-12 dual language master plan. So that roadmap, roadmap that your district has uh, that then guides the work forward, especially as you go up grade levels and uh, go from school to school. And if you don't have a K-12 dual language master plan, um, Dr. Katherine Karrison is our, our resident expert on this, and she has developed um, a template. She shares her own work and then guides people through the process. So um, you can contact her directly. I, I always put her name out there, but also um, uh, we're contracting with her to offer some statewide uh, dual language master plan workshops. And uh, we'll have a couple of those later spring. So uh, who does the dual language annual program evaluation? And that would be the school and district team, a collective uh, group to, to conduct that evaluation. Down the road, uh, we would like to be able to offer peer evaluators um, as a possibility. So these would be folks from the OSPI uh, dual language steering committee that are are basically volunteering to come be a peer evaluator. And um, so that's one of our hopes is that would be available down the road if people wanted to have an outside evaluator come in. And what we're gonna do this year, uh, so the uh, focus is rather than all the rubrics in the guiding principles for dual language, we're just gonna focus on program structure, which is strand one. And um, really, if, if you don't have a K-12 dual language master plan, when you go through the uh, rubrics in program structure one, it, it will drive you that way to, okay, maybe I better get my task force together and build out this master plan for the district. So uh, this, the rubrics are, um, I'm going to ship these to you via email, so you'll have it to do either a paper format um, and then scan it and email it to me, or preferably, um, you'll be able to use our dual language education program evaluation tool. 
and uh, Dr. Kauri Strunk at OSPI, she's building this for us. And she says February, it's, it's gonna be launched. So we'll have that available soon. And what it is, it's um, easy to use. It's a Microsoft form. So it's almost like filling out a survey. So the rubric will be in there. And uh, then you just hit the radio button that matches. Is it partial alignment for our school in this area? Or maybe we're exemplary in this area. And that data then on the Microsoft form gets collected into like an Excel format. And then what Carrie is doing is building out um, a Tableau workbook for each district. So you'll have this secure Tableau site that you can go into and just see your district's data on dual language um, with the form, or I'm sorry, with the evaluation tool. And then over years, you uh, would have your longitudinal data. So you could um, quickly make some displays to show, for example, board members or annual reports, um, stakeholders. Um, so it would be at your fingertips and it wouldn't be something you'd have to go create um, and dig up data and tables, et cetera. So that's our hope with this. And when that comes out, um, I will email that out to you, the link, as well as some step-by-step -step, um, directions to get into it. But it is very e easy to use. It's, it's like a survey gizmo almost. It's, it's quite easy. Um, and then I'm asking that uh, folks, please complete your uh, program evaluation. So on strand one program structure by June 25th. And um, that way I would have all the deliverables um, in time for when our grant closes on June 30th. And also just a quick reminder on spending. Make sure you um, spend all your money in your grant uh, by June 30th. And, um, and I have to say, I, I had to learn the hard way. I had been saying encumber your money by June 30th, but it turns out it really needs to be totally spent. So spent and, um, and invoices in, if it was like work with a consultant, those would have to be received then. Or if you purchased curriculum, that would help also have to be received at that point. So just uh, keep that in mind with your planning that everything needs to be in-house and done uh, June 30th. And I'm gonna turn this over to your colleagues now um, and they're gonna share evaluation ideas that they've been doing in their schools and districts. Okay, so East Valley School District number 90 in the Yakima Valley. I don't wanna be confused with Spokane, we're not that big. Uh, <laughs> so I'm Liz Hawkins and I, again, I'm, I'm principal uh, at one of our three elementary schools. And so our, our demographics are sitting here. I don't think I need to go through all of them, but we are actually in year 16 of implementation of a dual language school. And so we do have a two-way 50-50 model if you look at like our EL enrollment, if you go on and look at our bilingual enrollment, you will see that um, it's really tough for us to keep that 50-50 look. And so uh, we really lean into the Spanish side, the Spanish immersion side for our students, trying to kind of balance that out and make sure that they're getting enough Spanish. Uh, as you see, we've moved it up to the middle school and we've moved it up to the high school. And, um, yeah, that's kind of our demographics. That's where we're sitting as a district. And we could go to the next slide. Am I moving? There we go. Okay. So this is like my only slide. <laughs> I'm a woman of few words. Okay. <laughs> the work we have done with Strand One in our district has, has been really small. Um, we have worked at, uh, so I, I was on the development team, right, for developing this rubric, um, which we pulled directly, directly out of the book uh, and worked really hard to make it so that it made sense as a progression. And as far as bringing it back to our team at my school, um, it's been introduced to them. We've sat down and we've looked at it. I've gotten some 
feedback from that team as we were developing this tool. And um, then the big Rona came. So it kind of mm, put the brakes on things for us. Our, our minds went in different directions on how to serve kids. And what we're really hoping to do is we have a district wide team uh, for dual language uh, so that we have teachers and admin from the elementary, middle school and high school for our dual language program. And we want to use this, which we will be, um, for the strand one for evaluating what we have so far. And I'm super excited because it's going to clearly, it's going to give us clear signals for what our next steps need to be. And I'm excited to do that, but that's kind of where, where our school is with actually using this uh, work, this, this rubric for strand one. All right, thank you, Liz. Um, so once again, we're in um, the Yakima Valley as well, not too far from East Valley Yakima. And um, we have, we're a medium-sized district as well. We have 3,800 3, students. Um, the majority of our English learners speak Spanish. We're in year six of implementation, so kind of middle of the road. We did just this year shift from 50-50 to 80-20, and what a year to do that, right? Um, but it's been an adventure. We love it. We were able to add a transitional kindergarten dual language, one-way bilingual program, as well as an inclusive preschool classroom with ECAP, um, special education and community preschool slots. So we're very excited. We're looking ahead to middle school implementation next year. And on the next slide, you're gonna see that SELA is very unique in the fact that we are all Vikings and we have five different schools that every single student attends. So for example, um, our new preschool and kindergarten will house all of the kindergarten and preschool for the entire district. And then all of our kids will go to first and second, third through fifth and so on. So it's really kind of a neat experience and um, it builds a lot of community, but it can provide challenges in keeping program structure and making sure that all those voices are heard as we move from building to building with different leadership. And I would, I wanna share with you some tips and tricks on how to do that. Um, no matter your size, I think it can be a challenge. And so uh, on the next slide, you'll see some examples of how we've set up um, program structure within our district. So in, in program structure, principle three, uh, key point A is about shared leadership. And that can be hard um, to do. So what we designed is um, a series of task forces. So our district pillar teams that you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner are all about implementation of our strategic plan. And so we wanted to make sure all voices are, were heard in our process of planning dual language and our elements of our strategic plan. So we put together this systems map to kind of map out what voices we're hearing and how, and how does it impact dual language. Um, so we have our migrant PAC and EL parent leadership team meetings that go on once a month. And we have our, um, our task force that was put together to really focus in on closing the achievement gap and that included parent and community members, staff, and then admin. And then we have a admin leadership team for dual language that meets. And then we have a dual language um, teacher leadership team, as well as our, we have an ELDL coach at each building that has a CSL. And all of these teams have representatives within the district strategic plan. Um, so we're able to take, for example, our dual language and admin leadership and take a look at our master plan that we adapted from Evergreen. Thank you, Catherine, for your guidance with that. Um, and we took a look at our guiding principles and we, I actually, um, plans to take a look at it again this next month, breaking it out between each of the principles and having our team take a look at our master plan to make sure all of our elements are there that we would like to be present. Um, so that's one way that we are looking at our master plan and ensuring program structure is present, as well as having regular set meetings with these teams so that they can um, not only look at how our program is running and the structures of it, but to see how um, impactful it is and ensuring that we have student and parent voice as well. So on the next slide, you'll see an example of Carnegie's um, Plan, Do, Study Act, which is basically a 
called a PDSA cycle. It's improvement science in order to close the gap for kids. So having that equity centered focus in, um, is part of our strategic plan in CELA. So really um, with our task force and with our community members, focusing our efforts into really understanding what are causing gaps in our district um, for opportunities for kids, chan generating change ideas through stakeholder interviews, through looking at research, through looking at curriculum and our data and what, what the output of our current system is. And then we're going to take one of those ideas and see if and implement something and see if it works. And so um, if it works, then we can sustain spread and scale. So one of the ways that we've taken this improvement science and implemented it in our district is at each building. On the next slide, you'll see um, we have our EL or DL coaches implementing a different change idea at each building, um, as you see represented on the Pentagon. And then they're each trying to cycle. And as we try these cycles, we're moving together towards that goal of closing the achievement gap or equity gap for kids in our district. So each person might start with a different change idea, but as we learn from each other and as we look at the data vertically together once a month um, we'll be able to close that gap and spread and scale what works at each school across buildings across departments and across cohorts so there's one of the way we're trying to build systems into our school improvement planning process in order to make sure that we are truly breaking down barriers for kids um, part of this process is is really um, giving voice to the people we serve and so making sure that we interviewed families and especially um, we worked with our Migrant Parent Advisory Council to give those empathy interviews as Carnegie calls them or stakeholder interviews to see what it is as a district that we could do um, to make a change. And so on the next slide, you'll just see a, a quick culmination of that data. Um, these are the things that our, our community shared with us and really having parent classes on how to help um, in, in the home language was super important to our families as well as having bilingual staff and cultural awareness, um, having our leadership with that common vision, taking a look at our adult mindsets, and, and then making sure we have culturally responsive teaching. So as a result of this, um, of our task force work last year, we are able to implement this year some virtual um, events with families where we are celebrating culture. Um, we have a very fun art night coming up where we're focusing on um, Mexican string art. We're having a real life Yakima Valley artist come and teach and then we're sending home kits with all of our migrant families and any other families that wanna join in. And we'll be focusing on literacy and how to help your child with literacy in the home and kids will be able to make a project with the artist live. And so we're really excited about that. And just a lot of these ideas are truly from our migrant parent advisory council and the survey we gave out. And so um, just excited about where we're headed. We're also going to be offering mental health um, series of classes for both parents and students in Spanish. And we have some MSWs on our staff and our, it was our, our migrant parent um, leadership's team's idea. And that's it. Um, just so exciting to see how um, a small town really comes together and looks at needs and makes changes for kids. And so we have um, much more to do and much to learn, but I just wanted to share a few examples of how we use program structure in a, in a medium to small size district here in CELA. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to Mount Vernon School District and Melissa. Thank you, Stephanie. Hello again, everybody. I'm Melissa Van Stratton, and I'm here uh, at Madison Elementary in the Mount Vernon School District. So the Mount Vernon School District has a little bit over 7,000 students with nine schools, six elementary schools, two middle schools, and one high school. Here at Madison, we are the school that has the dual language program. So we are a fully K-5 dual language school of a little over 500 students. And this is our 13th year of implementation. Um, and our program is a two-way, uh, we have a two-way model, a 50-50 model two-way program. And we are working together. We have incredible district support. And so we're working together to build um, really not just a, a K-12 pathway for dual language, but uh, as of next Friday, we will be welcoming our first group of transitional kinder students. So a TK-12 pathway for dual language. 
Uh, Juan Gaona is the principal here at Madison Elementary, and, and then again, I'm, I'm the assistant principal. And so the perspective that I'm going to be bringing right now in terms of use of the program uh, structure evaluation tool is really from the school perspective. And so on the next slide, I'll start to talk about how we used this tool with our site leadership team or our school leadership team to inform our school improvement plan uh, for this current school year. So a little bit about our site leadership team structure. We have one representative from each grade level team in the school and each specialist area. So our team is um, on the larger side, but it's representative of every uh, stakeholder group in the school. We also have a family representative who is on our parent teacher organization board. And so that is so that we can be aligning our efforts together as we're all trying to work for families and students. And so in a traditional school year, this team meets monthly. And our primary purpose or responsibility is to collect and look at school-wide data that encompasses academic data, behavioral data, in order to make the decisions that are going to um, guide the development monitoring, monitoring and the revision of our school improvement plan. And that's so that we can carry out our own vision and mission here at Madison and align that with the district's strategic plan. So the way that that worked last year, we uh, were really intentional at the beginning of the 2019-2020 school year with our site leadership team, our school leadership team to base our, our conversations around the guiding principles uh, for dual language education. So um, if I could offer from the building perspective a key takeaway, it would be really make sure that you purchase uh, the guiding principles for every staff member in your building, uh, teaching staff, support staff, um, and, and utilize it. And, and we did that last year and um, we've got lots of, of flagged and highlighted pages and um, that's the purpose of it because we go back to it a lot, not only to the rubric part of it, but each strand has um, a nice literature review at the beginning. And so it's a great way to ground our conversations in research um, that's been synthesized um, by lots of different people who are invested and involved in the work. And so, so we did that. So at our first meeting last school year, um, the, the site leadership team um, discussed, read and discussed the literature review um, for strand one for program structure. And that really was the foundation for our work. And then at subsequent meetings, we reviewed the program structure tool that had been developed um, by the a subcommittee through the dual language steering committee, um, but based very much so on the guiding principles. And then each grade level team and representative that was on the site leadership team took that tool to their own representative grade level team or specialist area team, for example, and each team self-assessed using that tool. So thinking about as a school, as a K-5 dual language program at an elementary school, how do we stand? Where do we fall? And so we brought just the school lens into that work. Um, and we used a Google form, um, started with a paper, uh, pencil, highlight, um, copies and then we turned that information into a Google form so that we could compile and analyze the data to present it um, and make some decisions about it and then turn it into our school improvement plan. So the next slide gets into that a little bit. Um, a little bit difficult to see, but I, I wanted to snap a couple of images from the actual Google form data that we had generated. So um, on the left, it says key point C, the development of sociocultural competence is part of the program design. And so teams, um, we had two teams that thought that we were full in that area, but seven uh, thought that we were only partially there. And so we identified that area um, needing to continue to develop our sociocultural competence here at Madison as an area that we wanted to build into our school improvement plan. Key point E, the program is articulated across grades. Um, six thought yes, three thought no. Um, but if we've got a third of our school thinking that we aren't articulated across grades, we're not. And so we wanted to continue to focus on that work as well. So um, this is what the data looked like based on the process that we used. And then the next slide has just a copy um, 
of a, a portion of our school improvement plan. So I highlighted uh, really where this work showed up, but the, um, the second paragraph really details how we were going to continue to work with Karen Beeman and the Center for Teaching for Biliteracy to um, write our biliteracy unit frameworks. Um, but I highlighted where it says, we will work as a school to engage in vertical alignment work uh, within our unit maps and our content integrated units. So that's where that came through. Um, and then down in the last paragraph, Madison staff will continue to engage in uh, professional development on equity, social justice, and anti-racist pra practices. And this work directly aligns with the third pillar, which is sociocultural competence. And so um, we were really trying to be strategic about aligning each of our um, efforts or actions in the school, school improvement plan with uh, one of the pillars for dual language and also making sure that the decisions that we were making were coming out of various sources of data, but this program structure evaluation to being uh, being one of them. And so we um, plan to continue to use that tool again as a school this spring um, to be able to track and monitor growth and to be able to inform our school improvement plan um, very similarly in um, for next year in, in the years to come. So that's how we were able to use the tool here at the school. Um, and in doing it that way, we've gotten some great traction. And so um, involving everybody, all grade levels, all teams having the opportunity to self-assess and weigh in um, to inform the plan. Um, at each staff meeting then we pull up our school improvement plan as a reminder um, and as a connection to what the work is looking like and why we are doing it. And um, it's really allowed us to uh, be in a position where we're all um, pushing in the same direction or rowing in the same direction um, around the around the same things. And so I, I really think that that tool um, and the way in which we used it last year to inform our plan for this year um, played a role in that. And from here, I will turn it over to Dr. Katherine Carrison. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, this is just a snapshot of Evergreen Public Schools. We're down near the border of uh, Washington and Oregon along the Columbia River. We've got a little bit over 25,000 students, 34 schools, 22 of those are elementary, six are middle, and the rest are either high school or specialty uh, high school or academies. Uh, you can see our English language learners there. While we have over 68 different languages uh, spoken by kids in our ELL program, the majority of those, over 2,200 of those students um, are Spanish speakers, which is why we decided to go with the Spanish dual language program when we were planning about 14 years ago. We're currently in year 10 of our implementation. Our first group of kindergartners from our first school is in ninth grade this year. Uh, we have at our elementary level a 90-10 model, and um, we are working very hard at, uh, so we have two elementary schools that are implemented, and they're implemented K-6, or I'm sorry, K-5, six years of implementation. At one of the schools, we implemented with two classrooms at each grade level for dual language. At the first school we implemented, um, we were just beginning to learn the importance of uh, the program structure. And we implemented with just one school at each grade level, but this is the first year we've been able to add. So we have our second kindergarten classroom at that first uh, school that we that we started our program at. Um, and so we've, we are feeding into two separate middle schools and uh, one of those schools is fully implemented where the kids have gone on to ninth grade to our first high school and the other school, the kids are currently in seventh grade. And we are working with that second high school who will be receiving that cohort in a couple of years. And we're already working on planning and courses, et cetera, with them. So we have a K-12 pathway uh, for dual language and we are learning along with everybody else how to do secondary well. Um, and just a little plug, if you're K-12 and you're still in elementary school, start thinking about secondary now. It's never too early to start. So on the next slide, I just have a little picture here of our master plan and a couple of people have already mentioned the importance of a master plan. And I just wanted to reiterate that um, even if you've already started your dual language program without a master plan, it is never too late to build a master plan. 
And it's so important to have that for the structure of your program and the sustainability of your program. Uh, people come and go. So you really want to have the strong bones built for your dual language program so that uh, it's not dependent upon people being there advocating for it. It's established. The other thing uh, before we move to the next slide, I just wanted to mention is um, the steering committee, uh, steering subcommittee that worked on the program structure um, rubric, which is uh, the many of us who are here today presenting. Uh, one of our goals in that process was to take the, the Cal program structure um, rubric uh, strand basically and try to streamline it a little bit. And we, we did some refining in terms of um, combining some things for different uh, sections on the rubric and also building the rigor into what it what would qualify as an exemplary school. So we tried to simplify it so it would be easier to use, but we also um, ratcheted it up a little bit so we could push our programs past what we thought was necessary for full implementation to ensure that we really are building sustainable and high quality programs. Um, and on the next slide, um, I just have some information to share a little bit about the process that we went through. Uh, and the, the experts on this right now are Camille and Jake. Um, they are now entering the second round of uh, self-review of our program and focusing on program structure. Um, a couple of years ago in spring of 2019, we brought together our uh, K-5 dual language team and we provided them some background information about program uh, structure. We looked at the Cal guidelines and we taught them basically how to use that rubric and how to do some of the, the reviewing pieces of different elements of our program. And then came away after several sessions um, of learning and talking and looking at different components um, or different principles and key points within that strand. Um, we, had, we came away with some um, recommendations. And so that was prior to us refining um, the program structure tool, which you will have access to. And so once that was done and we received the dual language grant again, we decided to, to do this, go through the process again, but this time with our secondary team. And so we just started that and had our first meeting this week with that team, uh, combining teachers and administrators with district folks um, to talk about dual language. We basically um, invited people to participate, kind of explaining what the process would be and then get, getting interest from them on a Google form. And that's kind of how we put the team together. Wanted, we wanted to make sure that we had teachers involved, teacher voices, as well as administrators. Um, and not just from the current high school and um, team that we're working with, but we really wanted to include the uh, high school that we'll be implementing in a couple of years so that we can get them thinking about program structure before um, they really started to build that piece. So um, basically, um, we just want to provide for them like, why are we going to do this? And how are we going to do it? And this would be for those of you thinking about putting a team together, this would probably be like, okay, here's some ideas for how to get started with that. Um, and our why is just basically, you know, what we're communicating to the dual language review team is we want to build an excellent dual language program. And with dual language programs, you're never done. You don't build the K-12 program and then walk away and it just grows on its own and takes care of itself. It requires constant oversight and constant monitoring. And so we share that and kind of underline the importance of that with the team. We want to have ongoing planning, always be thinking about what we're doing, what we're going to do, what we can do better, reflecting not only on our teaching practices, but on our program from, at both the school level, site level, and the district level with an eye on constant improvement. Uh, so we use the program structure as a way to kind of jump into that. And it serves a couple of different pieces, a couple of different purposes. One, uh, we are able to take teachers who may or may not have a depth of knowledge around what a dual language program is and structure, and um, along with administrators, 
and help to, to um, kind of uh, study them up on it, give them the opportunity to dig in with guidance and conversation around our, our history and our goals. And then also it gives, gives us a varied perspective of information. So we're, we're not just looking at it with our blinders on from the, from the district dual language team perspective. So the how we basically use the Cal guiding principles. Um, we focused on and are focusing this time again on strand one um, with an emphasis on those three pillars of a dual language framework, the biliteracy, bilingualism, academic achievement, and then the cultural competency piece so that we can identify areas for improvement in, in each of those pillars. And then um, by developing a strategic plan for moving our program forward, uh, we get we get buy-in from everyone and uh, raise the awareness and hopefully increase the the uh, rigor of our own conversations around dual language. Next slide. So uh, with our team putting together our program review team, um, we want to share with them and reiterate with them over and over again that we want them to grow in their understanding. We want to measure how our program is doing um, against this rubric that the state is um, sharing with us and develop some things, steps, next steps, goals that we can start working on, some tangible things we can start working on immediately um, so that they uh, hopefully have a clear vision of what we're doing and they understand why we're giving them a lot of that background information. And then of course, um, to develop or and or pursue our dual language program mission and vision. And as I mentioned, some of the perks are <laughs> of doing this this way, bringing people in for the, the conversation uh, and, and providing a lot of time for them to build schema is that they do build the schema, they have an understanding and they have buy-in. And um, the understanding piece is really important because what we've discovered is a lot of times the teachers out in the building when they're getting um, information and directives from us down here around dual language, sometimes they don't understand why we're saying the things we are or asking them to do the things that we're doing or taking um, the smaller program pieces in different directions from what maybe they think should be happening from the classroom teacher perspective. So having everybody together helps them to understand our perspective and where we're coming from. And then it helps inform our practice at the district level with that um, boots on the ground teacher facing students perspective. So we can make sure that we're providing the things that they need um, to be successful. And then um, one of the nice things for us is, and I don't know about all of you, but a lot of our teachers right now are super overwhelmed uh, because of teaching in this different environment that we have. And one of the things that we've been able to share with them is this, this is professional development. And so we're um, gonna be providing clock hours for them to participate in this work because this is time um, from their schedules and many of them are really strapped right now with all of the elements of remote or hybrid um, instruction in person versus um, online. And so being able to do things like pay them for lost planning time, um, provide clock hours, any, any of those things that you can do to help um, encourage people to participate. Um, sometimes those uh, extrinsic motivators help also along with helping them see that, that they can have a voice in shaping and um, ensuring that we have a strong program for our students. And I think that's my last slide. Yes. Thank you so much, Catherine, Melissa, Liz, and Stephanie for sharing uh, the examples. Really appreciate that. And we have, um, looks like six minutes here. Uh, how about questions for folks that you might have of uh, some of the colleagues here?
Um, I would just offer if Jake and Camille, because they're in the midst of this process right now, if you have any other insight or anything to share or gosh, wish we would have done it that way instead, um, any of those things would be great for the good of the order maybe, if other people don't have questions. I could share something that I think we've learned now both at the elementary team and the high school program review is that, um, and I, I guess that maybe we, we would have known this, but it's just having gone through it, it really became a reality that each individual professional has the schema of that role. And so then when we do a collaborative review, a program review, it's, it spans so much beyond each individual's uh, kind of the, the, their uh, schema. So it was on us, a, a lot of the sort of onus was on us to, to do a module of like PD and information, um, teaching them uh, about our program, even though they're teaching in it and they know that they know it inside and out from their perspective, um, we learned that we need, need to do a better job of really just providing that overall kind of broad, but also like in-depth overview. Otherwise, each element on the rubric is kind of foreign to a lot of the individuals. Another thing that I would add is um, that we, it was, um, we experienced a, a, a disconnect between administrators and all the way to teachers. So there is, you know, the district administrators, the principals, knowledge, the teacher's knowledge, the specialist's knowledge. Everybody has like um, an idea and uh, an experience with the program. And then when you get them together, then and then they see the key points of the guidelines or the, um, the, the you know, they work through program structure or whatever. Um, they, it's hard to get out of my brain and look at the big picture, look at the, the you know, get connected as, as one um, to, to do this work. So, so one important thing that we have learned is, okay, let's get out of ourselves and let's um, work as a team to look at, you know, what admin, the administration at the district level is doing and what connections they have already that we have no idea that they have, right? That they have been doing, that they have been advocating as well as the teachers at the teacher level, what are we doing that our administrators don't see? So um, it's just, a, a, I, I don't know, just connecting when we're working as a team is a very important so that we, we agree or we are happy with the score that we give ourselves, whether it's, we really need support or outstanding. Thanks, Camille and Jake. And that's really helpful to hear. Um, any questions or perspectives that folks wanna share? Um, I have a question. I'm very interested in what Stephanie shared that their, uh, her school district uh, is changing from the 50-50 model to 80-20 uh, model. And what decision, I mean, why did you come up to with this decision and what are the factors that are impacting this decision? It's a very good question. Um, one of the reasons we went through that is we looked at the data from the research from Thomas and Collier, and we knew that 90-10 programs were, um, that kid, we closed the gap faster for kids. Um, and while we didn't feel that a complete 90-10 program would be the best fit for our particular community, we know we knew kids needed more Spanish because we have an English dominant community that were the only place they were going to get it. And so that was really important to us. Um, it, it was to provide more Spanish. And that was the ultimate reason um, for making the switch was to be able to close that gap faster for kids and to provide more Spanish in their day. Thank you. You bet.
And we are at time here, and I know some folks had to hop off early to go to other meetings, but I just wanted to thank the panelists. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to share. And um, uh, names and email addresses are on the PowerPoint. I'm going to send the PowerPoint out to folks now, um, also with the Word doc of the the rubric that the uh, steering committee put together. And Catherine, I really appreciate you highlighting that it's slightly different than the book. It's based on the book, but the level of rigor to really have a fully implemented program is just a little bit higher. Um, and it's, it's about our focus of dual language here in Washington. Um, so I will um, send that out to everybody in an email. Um, you know how to get a hold of me if you have questions, but also please feel free to reach out to um, our colleagues uh, that shared today. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend.